Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, all the participants, principal, vice principal, head, dean, faculty, and participants. Welcome to this fourth day event, and I welcome all for the session number five. So, in this present pandemic situation of COVID-19, artificial intelligence and data science are playing a very vital role. Due to high precision and time saving, there is a tremendous speed in the progress of research and innovation in artificial intelligence and data science. Now it is possible to predict the speed of the disease, rate of the disease, to simulate the structure of coronavirus and the vaccine on that. It can be possible only because of AI and data science. Uh, considering the massive importance of uh, AI and data science, D.Y. Patel College of Engineering Akurdi organizes this event. Today is the fourth day of this event and session number five. In this session, we have our first speaker, Mr. Sandeep Reddy, who is the head of analytics and hiring at Graminer. He is a TEDx speaker. Now, he will talk upon career in data science, but no coding, illusion, or act. So before proceeding, before to proceed, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Sandeep. Sandeep heads the analytics and hiring team at Graminer. We solve business problems for its clients by identifying data insights and presenting them as data stories. Sandeep advises executives at leading enterprises and NGOs on data science. And this helps to transform organizations to an advisory in building teams and adopting a culture of data. As a TA head, he derives the hunt for great ideas, great data science team players across industries and campuses and attracting them to join the team Graminer. He is a passionate about the convergence of data-driven business leadership, AI and ML adoption across the industry, AI ethics and data privacy. With this great introduction, I invite a uh, personality in the data science, Mr. Sandeep, to proceed for his presentation. Over to Sandeep, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for the kind introduction. And I thank uh, Principal Sir and Vice Principal Madam and the committee that has organized this session for uh, giving me this opportunity. I feel humble that I'm able to talk to the students and the community of D.Y. Patel College of Engineering. So uh, I would uh, start with. Uh, <clears throat> could you just confirm if my screen is uh, visible to everyone? Could one of you confirm, please? Yes, sir. Oh, can, can I get started, madam? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining the session uh, early in the day. I understand this is the fourth day of the uh, AI conference that is being conducted virtually, and I'm so happy that the speed at which uh, this group has been able to switch from a in-person session to a remote session and, and execute a full four-day curriculum is a tremendous uh, execution performance as well as a testament to the strength that the college has built in terms of adaptability to the changing needs. So I applaud all the folks associated with this session for conducting this and pulling such a scaled event virtually. Thank you for that. So uh, you have heard about uh, in the last three days you have been exposed to different areas in which data science is evolving, the technology stack associated with it and how different companies have been approaching data science and one prominent theme that would have come out as the relevance of understanding of programming that has been called out. So as uh, anticlimax to the four day con conversations that you have been listening to, I pose this question, career in data science, but no coding. Is it an illusion or an act? Is this doable? So that's the topic that will be dwelling upon in the next 20 minutes to see do as an individual who is uh, who wants to get into data science, but your fluency or your comfort with coding is not high. Can you make a space for yourself in the data science industry? That's the key question we'll try and answer in this uh, session. Let's begin with. When you look at data science job descriptions today in the industry, you would have a series of asks the list of things that a person should know to get an entry level position or even 
uh, lateral position is this long. You need to experience with data collection. You to have strong understanding of data cleansing, transformation techniques, feature engineering. You'd have understanding of machine learning. Some people even ask for deep learning. You should be good at data visualization. Should be good at problem solving. You should have a good communication skills, written and verbal both. And you should have strong domain expertise. You have applied your essential skills somewhere. And if you're a little one two years into the industry, you're expected to manage a small team of people and all the skills. Is this realistic to have all these skills in a single person? The short answer is no. What you're describing really is a data science department. If so many skills are need of the R, you need an army of people who can do all of this effectively. If you expect everything to be bubbled up into one single person, you will never get this full stack data scientist. If fortunately you have all these skills, you are no longer available in the market. There are enough companies, the Fangle Group, Facebooks of the world, Amazons of the world who have grabbed you already. Uh, there is a stat in Silicon Valley that 80 plus percent of the, all the engineering ML talent that is attractive is already taken by these five, six companies. And if you come out of uh, US, the other advanced market for data science research is China, the Tencent, Baidu's of the world. They have taken the rest of the pie. So essentially what we are looking at is if you are trying to get into a data science team, you do not need to have all these skills in one person. Now let's play this further. It's human time, so I'll try to make this conversation not just educational, but a mix of uh, entertainment with education. So let's try the entertainment part first and then get to the education as well. So the kind of titles that you see off late in data science space, if you look at it, there is a combination of three things. They combine vanity words that you see here, chief, principal, senior, junior, associate, deputy, each of these. And then you see areas like data, statistical, ML, AI. And then they try to throw in all different activities that you do, starting from scientist and engineer analyst, which are most prominent ones. And then the slope starts going downwards. You have storytellers, you have ninja, chef, wrangler, evangelist, rock star, wizard, alchemist. Let's play out a few titles. A senior data scientist. It's a most easy to understand one. You are experienced data scientist. Now, if you play this further a little long, you would see creative ways of explaining your role. Principal AI storyteller. This sounds uh, interesting and also is complicated, so it must be really tough or it must be a great role. He can do magic. And if you're really getting creative, how about we mix the juicer further? You are an associate ML ninja. What do you do? I don't know. So the, if I don't know what you do based on the title, it means it must be much more impressive. So this is the state of titles that are being thrown around in data science industry today. Jokes apart, you could play this in any combination words and come up with a fancy title. That's what data science is all about today. You have buzzwords playing around and then you have budgets that are being spent on data science projects. Gartner Research has put out a num statistic or uh, their experience of multiple years. 80 plus percent of data science projects remain in pilot stage. They never see the day of the light. Of the remaining 20% that actually get deployed in production, less than one to 2% of them actually go on to demonstrate their business value. So if you look at it, all majority of the investments do not materialize in tangible business results for enterprise. Let's take an example. Google, Facebook, these are the companies that talk about A-B testing, right? They talk about if generating a new feature and deploying it on their website on real production for a small population. Let's say 0.1%, 0.2% of the population. Google talks about 300 to 350 different experiments running on their Google search on any given day. The reason a company like Google has to experiment so much is from a data science standpoint, you may have come up with a great idea of solving a problem. But if that problem does not generate business value, either in terms of increased revenue for Google, in this case, it's increased click through rate, which means more revenue for them or a shorter time to get to the click action. That means improvement in efficiencies. Each of these has to happen for a project to work through. If it does not, the value available for the data science team's output is not demonstrated. Now, let's look at some of the examples of where data science actually has been very effective. Let's take an example of a telecom customer. We, this is a uh, customer churn model that we had worked for a telecom player. Here, there are two business problems that we are looking at. Can we predict which is the group of customers who are about to churn away from the customer? There are two ways to go about doing this. You could do a simplistic decision based support model, which is this, which I'll walk you through. Look at the tenure of the customers. If they are less than zero to 12, 
you have a low risk of them churning out. But if a customer has been with you longer, more than three years, there is a high risk of customer bailing on you. Once you notice that this, you identify these broad strokes, then look at their bill amount, monthly bill amount. If the monthly bill amount is greater than $220, the chance of they moving out is less risky. But if it's less than that, the chance of they sh jumping and going to the next attractive price sensitive offer is high. The secondary check you could do that if their daily data consumption is greater than 1.5 GB on a daily basis. Chances are they would be lured away by a different telecom provider who is offering them higher data package on a daily basis for the lower monthly bill. So this is how you could look at data science being applied for specific use cases to solve specific problems in a way that you can clearly explain why you're doing something. How do I identify this narrow customer segment for whom I will offer more promotional uh, offers. Like if I know there is a pool of people who would jump, can I offer them a recharge coupon for say 10 rupees and keep them valid for the next one month? Is that a good idea or not? That's how you start applying data science outputs to actual action on customer end. When we tried this simple decision tree model, the reduction in churn was 30%. What it means is when we identified a group of 100 customers, Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, please, uh, hello. Please unmute yourself, sir. Madam, can you hear me? Uh, ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, now I can hear. You. Sorry, was there a long uh, gap, madam? No, 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 sir. No, sir. Just a no. minute. Okay. Not sure what happened, madam. Uh, so, uh, yeah. may I go ahead? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Sir. So, so using a simple data decision tree model, this is how we have seen performance. But what happens when we deploy advanced black box models? We were able to increase the churn reduction to 50%. But the challenge was we were not able to clearly articulate why a model was identifying someone as a potential churn risk in the in a simple way like I have explained here. So this is one flavor of data science. If you want to explain why a model is behaving in a particular manner, you have to trade off between accuracy and explainability. That's one aspect of data science that you look at. This is an example of how we have implemented com computer vision based deep learning model RCNN on solving a particular nature conservation problem for a Spokane Watershed Foundation out of uh, Washington State in the US. Here, what we did was when camera traps identify fishes flowing through the river stream, if you notice when the fish starts swimming through the camera trap, we had built a computer vision based model that would identify that a object in the video is a fish. Step one. Step two, we would identify that the fish is a species of salmon. And step three, we are also able to identify that the fish that is actually flowing in the camera trap is a steelhead species of salmon. So if you think about the power of technology, what you are able to do here is earlier when a uh, water conservation study had to happen in a river system. Trained biologists who have 10, 12, 13 years of experience, they would wear these long boots dress, walk down the river stream, catch the fish, audit the fish, look at its fin tail and identify that this is a steelhead salmon fish, record it and then throw the fish back into the river, catch and throw. So this is a very labor intensive exercise. And in order for you to do that, you have to invest a lot of human capital for people to walk down the river stream, which is 150 miles and then do this audit on an annual basis. So it's very taxing, time consuming and also not cost effective. When we introduce data science and create mature solutions like these, you are reducing the overall time that it takes to do a species audit in a, in a river system. And at the same time, you're reducing the number of people required cost and the repeatability of it. So this is how data science can be applied, not just in commercial spaces, but also for conservation. And this is one example that we have deployed. You can read about it more on our website. The next example I talked to you about is much more uh, easier to comprehend. We looked at the date of births for a large set of population over a 10 year period in the US. And when we crunched the numbers and looked at representing them in a calendar based heat map, what we found was this representation. Uh, the X axis is the day of the month and Y axis is the month of the year. And the way you read this graph is the darker the box, darker blue is more births on that given day of the total population. And lighter box indicates that there are fewer births that day. 
Now, this is what a, a, a data science model can do from a data aggregation standpoint and a data visualization representation standpoint. But this information on its own does not infer anything. If somebody has to look at this, yeah, I see boxes. There are different colors. Now what? The way you improve upon this information make and make it consumable, you specifically look at this darker zone. In September, there are large dark boxes consistently all the way from the second week of it till end of the month. The boxes are dark, which indicates that there are more babies born in September. Now, uh, human biology states uh, average uh, baby uh, is in the mother's womb from 36 to 37 weeks. So what that indicates essentially is now if you draw an inference, we combine knowledge that is public or common knowledge and apply it to data. You see that most of the conceptions happen around December. And what is so great about December and November in the US? That's the two holiday season, the Thanksgiving season where you have a long day off and then the Christmas break where you have a long period off. This is what is potentially uh, inside that you draw, which is resulting in more births coming up in February. This is just one pattern of how you can combine data aggregation and storytelling to come up with an insight. If you extend this and look at more for more patterns, April Fool's Day, 1st of April, the number of births is very low. Why is that? It could be a case of people actually not preferring to get their child born on that day, given the they would become the butt of jokes in school, college and family. At the same time, if you notice 13th has a very lighter representation of births. And now if you overlay US popular culture with this data, what you notice is 13th is not a preferred date of birth because of the perception that it's an unlucky number. Have you ever noticed when you get on a flight, be it Boeing flight uh, especially, you won't have a seat number 13 at all because Boeing is a US headquarter company and cultural influence state that 13 is a bad number. So you won't even find number 13 in a plane when you get on. Notice this next time you get in. And but surprise, surprise, 14, which is Valentine's Day, you have a darker red. So you, parents would want their kids to be born on that day, given that it gives them bragging rights. So you just seen an example of how information, which is data transformation of the data, arriving at insights and good representation on a visual layer like this, combining with storytelling amplifies the value that you are getting in. This is what we looked at in the US. Now let's get closer home. This is the same birth data that we have grabbed for India across a fixed period. And we have only the same representation. And now look at the stark difference. Miraculously, most of the births are before January, before sorry, before July of the month. Suddenly August sees a very dark light patch. What does it indicate? Does it mean Indians suddenly stop? Uh, uh, there are no childbirths in the month of August across the country, which is very unlikely, isn't it? Now, if you combine that, look at it, the first half of the year, January to June, the number of births is skewed towards the first half. One way to look at it is this. Then you start noticing a pattern on 5th, 10th, 15th, 20th, and 25th, and 30th of the month. The darkness actually increases consistently, right? What you're noticing here is, any guesses, anyone want to take a guess as to why do you think this is a pattern? Uh, you could type in the chat window. Students, if you want to comment on this, please raise your hand. Or you can type in the chat window. Too. <gasps> Sir, actually, they don't have access to chat window. Oh, is it? Yes, ma'am. If anyone wants to uh, chime in, please ask them. Yeah, students. Uh, no, sir. All right. So the pattern you would notice is in Indian education system, if you're not a particular age by 1st of August, you don't get admission in for that academic year. So parents would essentially try and get their kid ahead in the date of birth to get them into the school academic year. This has been the case before digitization started. So a caveat there, the data is before digitization and other system at hospitals came in. So this is a, this is a clear indication that parents are influencing how the data was captured in the first place. This is how you can look at data, combine it with the domain knowledge and make inferences that are practical to relate. This is one other example. Now let's look at an example of an enterprise. Recently when pandemic started and everybody was asked to stay at home, Netflix that is one of the leading players which utilizes this data to drive their operations. They rolled out a new offering called Netflix party. What this essentially meant was 
a group of friends family who wanted to watch the same movie where you wanted to watch the same movie going to a movie theater and watch it together you could do the same experience virtually where all of you would look at the same movie at the same speed and you start commenting and discussing about the movie the scenes the way you would do in a physical format so netflix was able to identify that there are a group of people who would want to do this and they were able to quickly roll out this offering in the lockdown in a three week period that's the strength of what data can do to organizations now let's look at so far we had looked at the entertainment aspect of the session now let's get to a little focused on the education aspect of the session for the next 10 minutes we'll look at what are the different roles and skills required in the data science space we would also look at the emerging roles that are there in the data science space that are evolving and i'll end with a few tricks and trips on how you as aspirants get want to getting into the data science space can make a mark for yourself let's start with the first one what are the five roles and skills in data science these are e before you even get to that point of focus skill in order to get into the data science you should have a prerequisite which is you should be data science literate what this means is a you should be passionate for data which means you should be comfortable enough to play with data you should not be scared with trying to do data analysis be it 100 rows 1000 rows or a million rows you should be comfortable with exploring data interface with data be it simple excel based google sheets based or if you are using programming or you are using a database you should be available you should also understand what the domain associated with the data is if you are looking at forecasting say for the number of students who would attend a session you should understand the psychic of how students attend sessions if you are talking about assisting an organization with their forecasting of say sales you should understand what the business is they are into what has been the past trends that's where the domain understanding comes into play then you should also have an eye for design because once you apply the data science toolkit how do you explain that information to a larger group that way the design aspects come into play this is prerequisite irrespective of any role you take in the data science space let's look at these five roles in a more granular fashion the first role is a data translator we need someone who can own the entire data science project from inception to adoption who thinks about how this will be put to test how do you translate the requirements that are at a domain level to a data level and how do you explain this information to all the team members this is a person who would understand what the business is all about what is a business trying to do what are the different skills that are required to talk to people how do you engage them and convince them to work with you these roles are typically business analysts domain experts and data consultants then second is a data scientist this is the role that is talked about the most when people talk about data science data scientist is the role in the data science field and that's how it is looked at this is the only role most of uh, us understand is the data science but they are just one part of the whole puzzle these are the roles who understand analytics approaches they are able to analyze data using programmatic techniques or tools these are the folks who have a greater understanding of statistical techniques machine learning techniques they are able to identify insights and they are good at mining data through programming these are the experts who are statisticians and they have a strong understanding of statistical theory they are able to apply that into practical areas and they are also strong in which models to apply and why then there is information designers these are the set of skills where once you have the model output how do i communicate that model information from a data answer to a business answer if the model says the p value is 0.12 what does it mean for a business user because i don't understand what dot 1 is do can i represent that in a bar chart which talks about these are the four representations for this month and a forecasting model says that you could either be at 80 orders in the next quarter versus 60 orders in the next quarter how do you represent that this is where information design comes into play architecture comes into play understanding of users how do they perceive information do you use a bar chart versus a line graph versus a pie chart that's where information design comes in they understand user centric behavior this is where they excel these are the roles that typically are ux designers and information designers you still have to have a flavor for data but these are the additional skills that you bring to the table then you have a skill called ml engineers these are the folks who actually make the data crunching possible for any data science project to be done you first have to collect the data you have to have the data in a shape that is accessible you have to have the data which can be accessed and applied upon real time so somebody has to build this pipeline that's where the ml engineers come into play remember the statistic i talked about less than 1% of the projects actually deliver business value 
productionization is the key there. So this is a group of skill that actually make it happen. Can you scale your solutions? These are the folks who have a strong software engineering background and they can code uh, at multiple depths. And the last skill that is still essential in all this is that of a data science manager. This is a person who has to pull all these teams skills together and make it happen. Just having an army of data scientists on your team doesn't cut it. We have to have someone who can bring them together, execute it, prioritize and make it happen. So this is where the project management skills come into play. And this skill is least appreciated on teams, but this is the skill that makes a difference whether a project becomes successful versus not. So these are the five different skills that are the core skills for a data science team. You could look at more than half of these skills are not programming dependent. That's observation one. Then let's look at the emerging roles that are there in the data science space. Once you have uh, analysis done, this is an example of uh, voting patterns in Senate in the United States. When we looked at, we were trying to identify if there is a Republican senator and a Democratic senator, what is the chance of both of them voting together on a bill? What is the chance of the type of topics that they will both vote together versus uh, distinctively? When we have that information running a linear regression model of their voting patterns, the model would give you a beta value of 0.87 or 0.84. But how does it help someone infer it? The way you would do it is, if you look at this chart representation, what it indicates is the red dot is a Republican senator and the blue dots is a Democratic senator and the green dot is a independent senator in the United States. By looking at this, what you notice is most Democratic senators are clobbered around a small set of circle, which indicates they vote together. And the Republican senators are on the outer circle, which indicates they vote together with the Republican colleagues, but not with the Democratic colleagues. And if you look at the independent senator, Mr. King from Maine, you notice that he is neither totally aligned with the Democratic senators nor with the Republican senators. So this is how you combine data storytelling skills on top of your data analysis and data science skills to make sure the information that you are arriving at is communicated through engaging business stories. A story is a combination of a good visual that you see on the left. It's the context that is explained on senator voting pattern and there is a narrative on the right side which talks about how the voting pattern is shaping up. This essentially is a skill of where you're combining data journalism. This is where off late if you notice in bulk of the newspapers you see different charts and visuals being used by journalists to explain data. That's one core skill and creative arts where you combine your graphical representation and user experience design and combine this for data storytelling. So this is one newer emerging roles in the data science space. Then there is a space for behavioral psychologists. What this is, data on its own is not uh, unbiased. Data could easily stay. Uh, let's take an example of uh, students. When you are uh, making getting to a competitive exam, Today, the way your admissions is being conducted is if you uh, on a ranking basis. That on a given exam, if you score this many ranks and on first in, first out, you have an allocation that is happening. What if, if the colleges opt for a model where you are also considering your 10th marks, 12th marks, and any uh, 10 other aspects and using a data model to give weighted scores and then get to an admission step? And what if we extend that to a little further, say whether your parents are educated, what level of education do they have, whether you have siblings, whether they are educated or not. Now so you see the slippery slope where this is going. Just having access to data and including it into the model isn't enough. You have to also understand whether that information can actually lead to a positive outcome or a negative outcome. That's where behavioral psychologists come into play. And this is a very emerging field. You see a lot about uh, emergence of data privacy concerns, and this is where this skill comes in handy. And a related skill is the data ethicist. Here, extending the data privacy concerns of usage of data, the kind of inferences I draw, this is an example of what we had done for an em uh, employee engagement. What we did was we, instead of talking to people who are you most associated with, we took all their email communication, excluding the body of the email. We only took the header information, which talks about who sent the email, when and to whom. When we plotted this information and we tried to understand, one gentleman by name Pratap, he's only connected to these uh, eight people in the entire organization, though the organization is 200 people strong. What does it indicate? Can I use this information to say that this gentleman is only talking to a limited set of people versus some person is talking to one person a lot, but these two are not on the same team or they're not on the same project. 
should i actually make such connections is it even legal for me to draw such inferences can i penetrate the data at these levels to draw inferences from them a data ethicist is the one who draws the boundary whether you should be able to access an information in a way that is legally compliant or not this is a emerging area because of the prevalence of data right now the recent uh, conversations that we have seen about uh, contract tracing apps globally uh, be it in the us singapore china india uae uae for that matter and uh, some of the apps have been asking for access to your contacts to your voice calls to your videos so there is a varying degree of how controls that you can put in and that's where the data ethicist comes into play so these are the three emerging roles that you also can explore in the data science space now to the last tip of it a few tricks and trips for you to engage and how do you make a career in data science number one as i said most data science projects solve the wrong problem that is why they fail to generate business value so having an understanding of applying a knowledge of a domain is key not just focusing on how to get the data science problem solved like doing data analysis but you also have to see are you solving the right problem let's take an example uh, we uh, pro, prof, <clears throat> we had seen speaker talk about building google assistant right now think about it the, there is a attraction to push most of the operations that we do to assistants like these where you are essentially talking about can i order a pizza through google assistant tell okay google order a pizza from domino's or okay google do this do that now the challenge you'll run into is the moment most of the activities that are done off hand are moved to assistants like these and you are eliminating jobs that were being done by people in the past so automation essentially would start eliminating any repetitive work and grunt work that can be automated so having the knowledge of what to automate and why to automate like for example of ordering a pizza from domino's you understanding how the domino's uh, apis work you understanding what is the different uh, pizzas and the different toppings that can be implemented how does that interface with the api that google allows for how do you convert that from voice to text to one these are all the different applicational details that are important only focusing on data science problems will put you at risk that is where you have to improve your skill on applying knowledge step 2 data analysis is required but you need lot more than that what is that more you essentially have to have these non core skills what are these non core skills we talked about some of them in the core skills and the emerging skills you should have an ability to combine the information that you have this is an example of how we have worked with world bank to visually narrate the innovation technology and entrepreneurship uh, survey that world bank had done and identify which countries are favorable for innovation and which countries are least favorable for innovation and we wanted to draw inferences so by combining that information that was collected through a survey overlaying it in a visual representation looking at it from a cluster standpoint and grouping them by region doing a color coding and representation we start noticing that you are conveying the same information in a much more engaging manner this is what a holistic data science solution looks like so you have to think about how do you like communicate an idea better how do you explain the results in a more interesting manner so that people understand it and then act upon it that's skill number 2 skill number 3 you have to sharpen your ability to handle data the least fanciest activity in a data science uh, life cycle is handling data this is a famous quote by kirk bond it talks about in data science 80% of the time is spent preparing data and the other 20% complaining on preparing the data that's a pun intended line but it actually actually summarizes what you're seeing when you start learning or when you start your journey on a data science career most of the time you start with a clean data set which is easy to apply and run but in reality you will never run into that situation you would have to spend time collating understanding cleaning data and transforming it so this is a skill that you have to be very patient about learn this skill this is what would differentiate someone who can get things done versus someone who is waiting for data to come and the last skill the technology gets obsolete very fast in data science which means you have to be very agile to learn newer tools quickly and if you take a sampling of the tools in the market today this is the landscape in 2019 end of 2019 there was a uh, mark group published by persmark and if you look at this this single slide has little over 1000 close to 1000 representations of tools that can be used in the data science space now is it realistic for everyone to learn all these 1000 tools the answer is then no but what will help is the tool doesn't matter a person's skill with the tool matters which means 
your ability to pick a new skill and apply it on a tool is essential even if you are very good at uh, doing one thing very well that's important if you only do excel well so be it but if you are good at it it's easier for you to take that skill in excel and translate it back to a different new tool that is required so that's the strength of what learning ability is all about to summarize you have these four broad tips that i would encourage each of you to do now as part of your academic curriculum how do you do this is a question now a how do you stay relevant because you learn there are 500 more people who are doing the learning part then how else would you stay relevant and make a good career path for yourself step 1 you read and write about data science it does not have to be fancy you do not have to be an expert to start writing about your experience or uh, learning from others making Hello, short yes madam uh, sorry to disturb you actually you have 5 uh, minutes left sir yes madam thank you okay sir. yes yes madam i am close to end so you can read and write about data science you should create a understanding about how you are learning the subject so that you others can benefit from it this is one area that you could improve upon and add value to your profile you should do your own projects there is a army of sources available today where you can pick data sets and problem statements with varying degree of complexity and create your own projects then you can compete apply and reapply and learn from different competitions and last you should maintain your public portfolio be it on github or uh, tableau public any of these free sources that are available creating a public portfolio essentially ensures that you your work is a documented visible and others can easily access what you have done so this is the closing tip that i would give it to you and that brings us to the end of the session now so what is the conclusion that we would draw i can't even code so what do you think do you see a potential for having a career in data science without coding or is it still an illusion uh, madam could we unmute uh, students to hear from them uh, yes sir i'll ask students uh, students uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, you can answer the question Fuck. students anyone anyone student you can raise your hand student those who want to ask question raise your hand unmute yourself and ask the question hello Hi. sir yes ma'am uh, actually there is no hand raised by the student okay madam uh so uh i'm open for questions madam i am done with uh, the session that i had together okay. and uh, there is a, could i paste the survey link in the chat session madam for everyone yes, to sir. comment yes sir yes sir okay. thank you everyone for uh, making time for the session i had shared a link for a, a google form for a small survey post even i would appreciate if you could spare 2 minutes to uh, fill that form it would help me to a understand how the session went and also improve upon the session Okay sir. Thank you for your time. Okay. Madam, that oh, brings you, me sir. to the end, madam. Okay sir. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you sir. Thank you sir. Uh, thank we are you. honored to have you as a speaker today. Sandeep, and Sandeep, uh, I would like to, before you close that I have a one question. Yes sir. Okay. Okay sir. If you permit, uh, Nehal. Yes sir. Yes sir. Please. Uh, you have. Uh, given wonderful uh, presentations and uh, uh, it's a uh, whether to be a coder or a non coder mm -hmm. uh, the programmer or non programmer to be successful as a data scientist or not and uh, this was the obvious questions for us and uh, if suppose i am not a programmer if i don't uh, have the knowledge of this c c c++ program this is java python all our kind of things then what is my role to be as a data scientist but i have a passion to be you know to be a data scientist so which are the various kind of the role you have explicitly very nicely explained so thank you very much number 1 uh, number 2 that uh, uh, the data scientist role is taking out this uncertainty uh, certainty out of the uncertainty and we know that the, as far as this humongous uh, generation of the data from the various sources the 
data which is being available, it is a structured and unstructured. Yes. Maybe um, 80 percent more than that, the, perhaps uh, the data is unstructured available. Then uh, specific question is that, and we takes a lot of efforts to prune it properly, clean it properly, and then translate uh, for the further processing. Uh, that uh, kind of the human best works has to be done by the various kind of the tool. So in, in such a situation, uh, we do have a number of the tools. So can any algorithms which converts this unstructured data into the structured data or the useful data, I would say, and making it represent into the proper format. So that will ease the job of, you know, the, the people who are cleaning kind of the things. So the, uh, can it be possible that some automation uh, as far as this uh, uh, making or preparing the data very systematically? Because we know that, you know, some of the, you know, the data, the, the very uh, repetitive works that we do, you know, already the robotic process automation engineers, you know, yes. do find this and try to get the insight of that and perhaps they uh, present it and then give the some kind of the analysis perhaps that is uh, done. So, can this uh, methodology uh, can be applied to this? Uh, this is the one simple question. Certainly, sir. Uh, and that's a burning question in the industry too, sir. How do you make a task automated so that you don't have to spend uh, precious human capital on doing the task again and again? Yeah. The challenge we run with is, uh, A, every task can be automated uh, to an extent with a cost-benefit analysis. After a point, a model's accuracy, uh, say it hits 70, 75%, the amount of effort and computing power that goes into automation and making it usable, incrementally, the economics of it go down. So getting a model from 75 to say 77, 78, would you have to spend more time and effort than you had to spend to get it to 75. And every incremental addition that you do has more cost involved. So whether the organization is actually willing to do that additional spending to gain that incremental percentage accuracy, that is where the difference is, sir. And this is why you see that bulk of the data science investments go into technology and banking and financial services. These are the kind of industries that spend more because there the cost benefit analysis of reducing effort is very high, like say high frequency trading. Your ability to complete a trade in a most logical manner in one hundredth fraction of a second would may potentially give you a hundred million benefit because you do faster. So you'd invest all the automation tools in it. But at the same time, if you come to uh, say, uh, bank and you are trying to cross sell an offer to a customer who's at the teller and you're enabling the teller to identify the set of products that are most appropriate to the customer. Here, the risk of accuracy is even if I can narrow down to three, four products that the customer needs, it is okay. So this is the struggle that the industry is in, sir, whether to invest in automation to what extent. This is how the reality is to summarize. You can do the automation, but is it economically fees uh, realistic is the only question, sir. There have been examples where companies have invested end to end automation, but there have been companies who are like, I don't need a fancy spaceship. I just need this to work in this cost. So that's the trade off, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, one relevant question uh, again with respect to uh, as uh, uh, understanding the uh, ethical and uh, the the employees, uh, those who are really uh, engaging properly or not, honest proper or not, whether they are value adding to the systems or not, or they are uh, they have the much of the integrity toward the organizations to have the proper uh, efficiency of the organization's uh, calculation. Perhaps this is the important thing from the management perspective. Yes, sir. So uh, uh, this kind of the problem, similar problems has been solved by the data scientist and can be immediately deployed. And will you be possible? It will be possible for you to help us into the three segments. One is from the admission perspective, kind of there is an uncertainty into this for pandemic situations. You know the fear factors as far as this uh, Pune, uh, whether there will be the possibility of getting the admissions zones to the various Pune engineering college. If it is there, the DY Patil College of Engineering, because we are not knowing also the who are the up applying for this one uh, and uh, then uh, with respect to the the number of the companies uh, you know they are predictions also the number of company this time in pand pandemic situations who are the best student for them best uh, employee for them 
and what will be the uh, prospectus for this uh, uh, this uh, KNT sales to you know to understand the uh, logics and thinking about the market uh, for the various companies. So uh, how we will be helping us into this? Uh, can it possible? Uh, from a possibility standpoint, yes, sir, it is possible to simulate some of these scenarios. But the one uh, one drawback or at least heel of data science is that the data has to be a good representation of what happened in the past. And an event like this, a black swan event, essentially throws out every logic that you had in place in the past. Yes, it's gone. So yes, gone. Huh. The, uh, the only semblance of what we can hold on to is after the event happened, what kind of information we have access to. Like, for example, employee information, which has been historical, that is still a good reliable indicator to talk about performance. And when people go remote, you have a metrics. But the challenge with student admission is their own baseline of what can be feasible, where to go, where to go, is a little uh, tough to get from a reliable data standpoint. So modeling can be initiated, sir. The, its ability to actually be more accurate and precise, that's where you'll have the challenge because you're only feeding it based off a couple of weeks of understanding, which uh, is not a good indicator for what it predicts about. Okay, thank you. This much from uh, my side. Thank you very much for the best of the best sessions and very clear understanding about the insight about your insights. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sandeep Reddy, for giving insight uh, of, of how to do career in data science. Really, you have given the tantra and mantra tips and tricks to the students and what are the various roles and skills that need to imbibe while doing career in the data science. You have given very interesting examples of the how to identify the Solomon speech, the presidential election, then the Netflix and the variation of work. Very interesting example you have given. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the opportunity.